This is On the Block with Bryce. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. Your listenership is so appreciated. On today's show, we take a look at public education in the state. They have made an unprecedented move into your private life, and you definitely need to be made aware of it. Then, you know, as our country is becoming ever so divided on racial problems that don't actually exist, real evil is happening around the world. We'll attempt to instill some gratitude for just how amazing this country is by examining some of those evil acts. Also, we'll dive yet again into the fact that our political leaders don't actually give a fuck about us, a topic I've beaten to death at this point, but still feel, for some reason, it's important to say over and over again until we all get it. And finally, we examine the blue flight coming out of trash heaps such as California, Illinois, and New York, and I will share with you and all those who have taken flight exactly what I expect to see out of them as they plant roots elsewhere. Okay, so just how much power does the state and its education system have in your life? Well, if you're like me and you don't have any kids, virtually none. But if you do have kids now, as many of people my age do, many people older than me obviously do, they're either somewhere between kindergarten and grade 12. This affects you a lot. Massachusetts has become the first state to require the flu shot for all students in public school. Let me say that again. Massachusetts has become the first state to require the flu shot for all students in public schools. That's insane. That's absolutely insane. So now, the government, because that's what public education is. It is the government. It's the state. The state has decided now that they are going to dictate what quote-unquote medicines are injected into your children. And of course, most people can't afford to take their kids to private school. And most people can't afford to not work so they can homeschool their kid. And that is the... That is the reason public education is there. And obviously, you have to have your kid go to school. It's illegal in most states, if not, I think all states, it's illegal to tell the state, hey, you know, I'm not sending my kid to school. So they already have you by the balls in that aspect. They make your kid go to school. And education is important. I'm not saying education for a child isn't important. But what I'm saying is the state forces you to either find a way that is very time consuming or very expensive to educate them or send them to the state where they will educate them. And now, where they will also dictate what fluids and vaccines go into them. This is a massive abuse of authority, as well as a huge intrusion on the private lives of the citizens of Massachusetts. And don't think that Massachusetts will be the only state to do this. You know how this goes. Once one state does it, and no one complains about it, other states will follow. In fact, even if people complain about it, other fucking states will follow. You can bet your ass on that. This, of course, is an egregious violation of every citizen in Massachusetts' rights. In the Constitution, it clearly states that the government of America recognizes each and every American's right to life, liberty, property, pursuit of happiness, and privacy. Those are the five rights that the Constitution of the United States recognizes as self-evident truths given to each and every individual in this country because without those five things, you can't even exercise the rest of the rights that this country acknowledges as being your own. This is why it's very important for each American to understand that the Founding Fathers didn't recognize the government as an entity that gives you rights or necessarily even protects your rights but as an entity that recognizes that these rights are yours and that they have no business trouncing on them, protecting them only when necessary and if needed. With that line of thinking, it's widely understood then that the only thing a government can really do when it comes to your rights, other than get out of the way and allow you to express them, is to get in the way and fuck with them. And that's exactly what the state of Massachusetts has decided to do with its citizens' right to privacy. They are basically taking the Constitution and wiping their ass with it at this point. As a parent... It is your right to decide what goes into your child's body. Not some fucking state official sitting in an office somewhere in a Capitol building or some shit like that. No, it is yours. That is your personalized, private choice, and the government has no business at any time to tell you otherwise. Now, when talking about this, we're specifically talking about something like the flu shot. I am not an anti-vaxxer. I'm going to make that very clear. I am not against vaccines, but it depends on the vaccine we're talking about. If we're talking about vaccines such as polio, hepatitis A and B, tuberculosis, those things are necessary as shit. Those things are modern fucking miracles. Understand this about those vaccines. Before we had them, just what, 100 years ago, some of them, some of them not even that far back, 
Before we had them, people in this country and around the world were dying in mass of these diseases. These things would grab hold of you at a very young age and you would not live to see 40. It's a fucking modern miracle of science and innovation and technology that we are able to basically eradicate these diseases. I will no longer get tuberculosis. I am incapable of getting tuberculosis thanks to my TB shot. It's amazing. And I think you would be a very irresponsible parent to prevent your kid from having vaccines such as those. But when we're talking about the flu shot, that's a different fucking story. The flu shot is not one of those miracle elixirs that cured a disease. The flu shot is something you need to take every year because the flu virus mutates every year. Polio does not. Tuberculosis does not. When you take a tuberculosis shot, you're no longer ever going to get tuberculosis. When you take a flu shot, not only are you guaranteed to get the flu with the shot, but you will need the shot the next year because your body is that much less capable of handling viruses on its own. This may be a little anecdotal, but I am 32 years old. I have never had a flu shot. I have also never had the flu. There is a correlation there. What is that correlation? It's very, very simple. Colds, flus, other viruses like that, they're flying around all the time. And I've been around plenty of people with the flu. My wife gets sick all the time. She's probably had the flu five times since we've been together. The difference between me and her is she has taken a lot of antibiotics. I have not. My immune system over the last 32 years has developed all on its own in a natural state, meaning that it is way more capable of fighting off certain smaller, less threatening elements like a cold, like a flu, all on its own. In fact, there's a good chance I've had COVID and didn't even fucking know it. As with most people, your immune system is like anything else in your body. If you work it out, it gets stronger. If you allow it to go lax, it will stop working. This is why people who are depressed who take lithium for their depression can't stop taking the lithium because the lithium fucks with the serotonin in their brain and then their brain no longer produces serotonin at a normal rate or even at all. Once you tell your body it no longer needs to do something, it's fucking weird, but it it does stop doing it. Your body's very lazy like that. It's really weird. And this goes especially for your immune system. If you do not allow your immune system to stay strong, stay sharp, stay with it, it will get lazy. This is why people who take a lot of antibiotics have to constantly take more antibiotics. Their body does not have the ability to produce antibodies on its own because it hasn't had to in a long time. The flu shot works the same way. The more flu shots you get, the less able your body is to fight off the viruses on its own meaning that you are more prone to more illnesses, not only in the immediate future, but down the line as you get older and your immune system weakens anyway. With all that said, that is why when it comes to things like the flu shot, as a parent, that is your personal, private choice to make regarding your children, and the state has no business in it. In fact, as I said before, it is a constitutional violation for them to say they do. However, here we are in Massachusetts deciding that if your kids want to go to public school, They have to be inoculated with the flu shot. Now, of course, there's a money trail to follow here. Some company paid some politician to push this law. Now, that politician has a second house for his third mistress. Fine, whatever. You know it's true. I know it's true. But let's not focus on that for for, for the time being. Let's focus on the fact that the government is telling you what you need to inject in your kids in order to send them to the facility that they have mandated by law that you must send them to if you can't afford the time or money to send them anywhere else. And it doesn't stop with the inoculations. As it turns out, teachers are doing a lot more than just teaching math. A couple of weeks ago, a bunch of teachers took heat on Twitter for opening a public thread in which they complained about how the Zoom classes they had to do were problematic because parents are now privy to what they're teaching their kids. And now they're worried that the walls have come down. They can no longer do it in secret. These teachers have admitted to teaching these kids leftist propaganda bullshit. We're talking 1619 revisionist bullshit in which systematic racism is real and that cops are hunting black people and that white people are immediately guilty because they're white and all this other nonsense that people are rioting outside over right now. We thought it was bad when it was happening with professors and college students. It's happening to your 12 year old. So as a parent, you have to make a choice. I'm really glad I'm not a parent right now. It just it just seems like an awful thing when the state comes in and tells you not only how to educate your kid, what we're going to teach them, and oh, by the way, we're going to inject them with stuff that we see fit. And you as a parent have no say, and you must play along. I, I can't imagine what that must be like. But 
be that as it may, those are the cards you were dealt. You're the ones who decide to overpopulate the planet, so you got to deal with it. You got a choice to make. Do I take the easy road? Do I take the free babysitting given to me by the state and allow my kid to be vaccinated year in, year out, constantly, weakening their immune system and putting them at risk further down the line when their immune system is so fucking weak when it shouldn't have been? Or do I make different choices? Do I find a way to get them out of public education? It's easy for me to say do the latter because, again, I don't have kids. But it's a decision each parent is going to have to make. And you know what? It's something we're all going to need to pay attention to, children or not, whether your kids are in public education or not, because these type of things where the government comes in and says, okay, you need a vaccination to come here or do this, they always start with kids, but they quickly spread to other groups. You remember like when they had the microchips, they were talking about microchipping people. They first said, well, let us microchip your pets because, you know, if your pet runs away, then they upped it to kids. Well, if your kid's kidnapped and then they move to adults, same thing's going to happen here. In case you forgot, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. How much money do you want to bet that once a COVID-19 vaccine is out, that certain counties, if not states, if not the federal government as a whole, depending on who the president is, will mandate that vaccine to each and every American citizen? This is not power the government's supposed to have. This is a massive invasion of your privacy. And even though some of us don't have kids, all of us are going to have to watch this closely. And all of us are going to have to make a decision about just how much power we want the government to have over us and our children if we have them. Okay, moving on. While we continue to tear each other apart over issues that don't actually exist, like systematic racism and the like, while we continue to burn down our cities because we are so outraged by these things that don't exist while we continue to preach propaganda to our youth about an oppressive American racist system that's so evil and corrupted that it needs to be torn apart from the very foundation and rebuilt into a Marxist utopia. While we continue to do that, there's actual evil out in the world. And I wanted to discuss two stories about said evil because I think it's important to understand that there's evil out there and to recognize that there's evil out there because perspective is a good thing. And I think when you can pinpoint actual real evil that we in this country are fortunate enough not to have to see on a daily basis because this country is actually pretty fucking great, when you can pinpoint that evil, you can better understand that this place is actually not that bad. And maybe if we can do that, we can finally start coming together and work on the problems that we have as a country that really do exist that are getting zero attention because we're too fucking busy fighting over problems that don't actually exist. The first story is compliment of the Daily Beast and comes to us from Russia. Surprise, surprise. Apparently, let me just read the headline because it really says it all. Russian teen forced to rape himself on camera for criticizing Putin's soldiers. Let that sink in for a second. This poor young man lives in a country that if you speak out about your oppressive government and criticize them for being oppressive, that government has the authority to take you, pin you down, and force you to commit sexual assault on yourself in order to teach you a lesson. According to the article, this happened last Monday. A video was posted showing a 19-year-old being forced to apologize for criticizing the regime and then penetrating himself with a bottle. That's insane. That's absolutely insane. You want to talk about oppressive, systemic evil? Well, there you go. It's right there. In contrast to America, which is supposedly this great evil place, I can walk up right to my leaders and go, Hey, fuck you. I hate you. I hate everything you do. You're fucking horrible. You shouldn't fucking be here. Hate your whole fucking family. And nothing happens to me. As long as I don't threaten them, nothing happens to me. If I tell them that I think they're useless, that I think they're terrible, that they belong in jail, I can say all those things and nothing happens to me. Why? Because I have a First Amendment right in this country. Because my government recognizes that I have an inalienable right to express myself freely, even in the form of criticism against them. In fact, that is something you don't really find almost anywhere else in the world. Only here. So the next time you call Trump a fascist, or the next time you say that this country is horrible and evil and racist and all these things and nothing happens to you, you'll know why. And put yourself in the shoes of that poor 19-year-old kid in Russia who, believe me, they're oppressed in ways you could never fucking imagine. Put yourself in his shoes for a second and think, well, Jesus, what if, what if we really were as evil as I thought we were? And I criticized Donald Trump, and then he sent his goons after me, and I had to rape myself with a bottle on camera. 
That's not your reality here in America. But unfortunately for the poor people of Russia, it seems that that indeed is their reality. One more story for you to put some perspective on what true evil really is in this world. China is in the middle of a systematic and calculated ethnic cleansing against a population of Muslims in their country. Fun stuff. According to this article brought to you by Bloomberg, as many as one million Uyghurs have been detained in camps the Chinese government is calling voluntary education centers, where people also face curbs on practicing their faith and are subject to state surveillance. Wow. Talk about violation of people's rights. Oh, I'm sorry, we don't have to experience that in America. Again, you want to know what true evil is? True evil is a government forcing you into a camp based on your religion and then telling you you no longer get to practice that religion and to make sure that you don't, we are going to watch you constantly. Of course, constant surveillance is nothing new in China. Different regions of China practice what they call social credits in which they watch each resident of that area constantly through surveillance and they calculate their behavior through a a system of social credit so if you go outside and you buy the right foods you get good social credit points if you go outside and buy bad foods you get bad social credit points and what you can do with those credit points is if you have enough you're deemed a good citizen and they allow you to travel they allow you to see your family and if you don't have enough they basically lock you in your house and say you can never come out that's china for you folks that's evil But the fun doesn't stop there. It wasn't enough to just send these Uyghurs to education camps voluntarily. No, there is a lot of talk that China is using them for forced labor. You know, what's another fun word for forced labor? Oh yeah, slavery. China has decided to take a bunch of people based on their religion, force them into camps, tell them they can no longer practice that religion, and while you're at it, guess what? You're going to do free labor for us. It doesn't get any more evil than that. Now, you can talk all the shit you want, and you can be critical of America all you want regarding their own history with slavery. That's fine, but understand this. America took part in the slave trade in a time when the rest of the world, literally everywhere else in the world, also took part in the slave trade. America was brought up in a time where slavery was a commonplace thing and had been for centuries. But in 2020, America, as well as most of the rest of the world, agrees that slavery was and is a sick, barbaric practice that should have never taken place in human society, and we are all the better without it. Except China is still doing it. They have taken this Uyghur population and forced them into labor. And the uncomfortable part about that, folks, really, is that that labor is making products that we buy. So every time we buy something that comes from China... Unfortunately, we might be supporting slavery. Of course, even if you're not, you're probably still supporting sweatshop practices that are absolutely barbaric and horrific and that poor Chinese people have had to suffer with for decades now. This is something that we as Americans could be working to solve. This is something in America that is a very big issue, in my opinion, that we are giving zero focus to because we're over here bitching about systemic oppression that doesn't actually exist. That's the problem when you do that. When you tear each other apart over issues that aren't real, real issues persist without you in real time. And there's nothing anyone's going to do about it. Not in this country anyway, because we're so focused on trying to keep people from burning down our own buildings. If you wanted to unify this country, if you wanted to get people together for a cause against systemic oppression, look to China. We could all sit there and do some boycotting. We could all sit there and yell at our elected officials to start working out new trade deals. We could do all of that, but we're not because we are instead arguing over a systemic racial problem that does not exist. So the next time somebody tries to come at you with systemic racist bullshit, give them these two stories. Not that anyone listening to this needed the perspective, but I wanted to share it because You you hear these stories and you realize just how great this country really is, and it's too bad that others don't see that. It's too bad the people doing all the rioting and looting don't understand that, that they don't bother to look outside of their own little fucking bubbles to see that there are real problems in the world, and that they are extremely fortunate to not have to live in a place that actually oppresses you. Okay, third topic, and I'm not going to harp on this too, too much because I've harped on it a lot, but I just want to remind you that your elected officials don't actually give a shit about anything they say they give a shit about. Perfect example is Chicago. This comes straight from CNN. 
An eight-year-old girl was killed in a drive-by shooting and was just one of 53 people shot in Chicago over the Labor Day weekend. 53 people, including a little girl. And yet, this isn't all over the news constantly, the way anything Donald Trump tweets is. You don't see any elected official visiting the houses of these residents who have lost family members in drive-by shootings. The way Joe Biden was so happily ready to go and visit Jacob Blake's house. Jacob Blake, of course, sitting in the hospital right now, recovering from seven gunshots he received from police officers as he resisted arrest and went to his car to grab a knife who hasn't been able to leave the hospital because he's handcuffed to his hospital bed. Why? Because he broke into the house of a girl who he had sexually assaulted a few months before to steal her car. It's amazing. It's amazing. And the, the, the reason that politicians pay attention to a guy like Jacob Blake and the reason that they ignore 53 fucking dead people in one weekend in Chicago is because one gives them political browning points, the other does not. One tells the false story of racist cops gunning down an innocent black man. The other tells a much darker, more realistic story that politicians do not want to face. And that is that all their policies in these inner cities have been horrific, horrific failures. They've taken the guns out of these neighborhoods so that people can no longer defend themselves or their kids. At the same time, they have promoted the idea that cops are hunting them because of the color of their skin. Therefore, they can't even trust the police. They have left them defenseless and without any help because they have also decided they're going to defund the police now. You allow crime to run roughshod through cities based on horrible, horrible policies, and then you hide from it. And that's what these politicians do. So they much rather tell the false story of a black man killed by racist white police than of themselves, failed politicians who put in policies that looked good on paper, but were absolute shit shows in real life that affected everybody but themselves. But what the fuck do they care? Because they still get elected, they still get paid, and if all else fails, they can just blame the other guy for why things didn't work out. They can always just blame someone else or something else. Democrats like to blame racism. Republicans like to blame Democrats. And they go round and round. And meanwhile, they count on nobody being the wiser to any of this nonsense. I know I harp on this a lot, but every week there's a new story, a new headline that reads 53 dead in Chicago. And all I can read when I look at that is politicians prove yet again they don't give a fuck about you. And it's the truth. So I'm not going to harp on it too much more. It's just I felt the need to remind you. And it doesn't matter what side of the aisle they sit on. Democrats say they care about black lives in the inner city. And yet their policies rip the inner city apart. You don't see any of Black Lives Matter or the politicians who support Black Lives Matter rallying around in Chicago right now trying to figure out how they can stop the next 53 people in the inner city from being murdered. You don't see it because they don't care. They only care about their agenda. You don't see Republicans sitting there and going, hey, there's slave labor going on in China right now. Maybe all of our policies that allowed companies to outsource and do horrific, un-American, inhumane things in other countries were a mistake. They don't face it. They won't do it. They say nothing about it. And this was your friendly reminder of that. Okay, last thing I want to do is bestow some wisdom and advice upon all the transplants who are fleeing states like California, Illinois, and New York, and heading to states like Florida and Texas and Arizona. I want to bestow upon you this wisdom because it's something you're going to need to know as you move from your awful failed state to a state that, let's be real, you perceive to be better in at least one way or another, else, let's face it, you went to move. So here's the advice. You obviously left your state for a reason. It is important to keep that reason in mind when you acclimate into whichever new state you have moved to. And it's important to keep that in mind because your failed state comes from failed policies. Failed policies in which you have gotten very accustomed to. Failed policies in which you may have even agreed with but didn't understand the ramifications of. Rent control in San Francisco is a good example. It created nothing but poverty, which led to more drug use and mental deterioration onto the homelessness of that particular city, which led to increased crime and therefore a very undesirable place to live. But when you sat there and said, we're gonna push rent control on all these greedy landowners, it seemed like a good idea. It created a shit ton of problems that you were now fleeing from. Or what about cities like Chicago and New York who don't allow their residents to defend themselves with guns, knowing goddamn well that the criminals still have guns because criminals don't follow the law. And criminals are, if nothing else, opportunists. 
And if you're sitting there defenseless because you have nothing to protect yourself or your property or your loved ones, you look like a pretty good goddamn opportunity, don't you? Well, that's when you decide to leave because the crime rates are through the roof. But keep in mind that they are through the roof because people are not allowed to defend themselves properly. Now, these anti-gun policies may have looked good on paper, and in fact, you may have voted for them, but now you're fleeing them, aren't you? So the advice comes into play. If you're moving to a state that doesn't have high crime, it's probably also because people are allowed to defend themselves. If you're moving to a state where they don't have rampant homelessness and drugs everywhere, keep in mind that's because they probably also don't have rent control. If you're leaving a state because things have just gotten so expensive and you move to a state where things are a lot cheaper, keep in mind it's because they don't have ridiculously high minimum wage demands there. And it's important for many of my fellow transplants who are coming from states like California and New York and Illinois, it's important for them to keep those things in mind because these are issues you may have felt very strongly about while living in the states you're now fleeing from. You may have been very anti-gun. You may have been very pro-rent control. You may have been very high minimum wage. Unfortunately, you have seen the effects of what they've done to your states, which is again why you're leaving. The last thing you would want to do then is come to a new state where they don't have those issues and start perpetuating all the same ideas you were so for in the state you're leaving that caused the state to fail, which caused you to leave in the first place. Basically, the advice is very, very simple. Do not California, my Arizona. Do not New York, somebody's Florida. And do not Chicago, somebody's Texas. It's as simple as that. Now, of course, I'm not talking about myself. I have never fit into California's leftist policies. I have never been a fan of them. I'm not a conservative by any means, but they are so far left, it's ridiculous. In fact, their policies are such garbage that because of them, the state is literally burning because they wanted to look good environmentally and not allow logging to clear out dry shrubs. So now the state's literally on fire. I'm more than happy to have left. And I'm only sad that I wasn't able to do it sooner but it is what it is. So with that being said, I'm more than ready to acclimate to a state that doesn't have all those failings because that's why I left California to begin with. So once again, my advice for all you transplants, don't fuck up other states because you want to perpetuate the same stupid fucked up policies that fucked up your state to begin with. If you're going to move somewhere, acclimate to their way. You left for a reason. You came there for a reason. Remember that as you settle in. And I think that's a good place for us to call it for the day. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. Once again, it means a lot to me. Hope you enjoyed yourself this last half hour. I know I certainly did. I was trying to get uh, two episodes out this week, but I don't think I'm going to have time the way I wanted to. But uh, hopefully until next week, this episode will suffice. If I can get it out, though, um, you know, it'll be a nice surprise. Maybe midweek at some point. Okay. I... Uh, I'm done. Enjoy. Enjoy the rest of your day. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to stay up to date on all our latest releases. Also, be sure to share this with your friends and help spread the word. Got something to add to the conversation? Let us know all your thoughts in the comments section. A link to the music featured on today's episode can be found in the show's description. On the Block with Bryce was recorded at Beer and Bourbon Studios, Maricopa County, Arizona, and is a Jerk Cat Entertainment production.